Good morning, everybody. You guys survived the winter storm, the blast, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, now <laughs> we'll see what comes next, right? Uh, I'm John Lundgren. I'm an entomologist. I'm an insect ecologist. I work for USDA ARS up in South Dakota. Um, very happy to be here. I'm going to talk to you. I have a little bit different perspective on insects. <laughs> Um, insects are not necessarily just something to be killed. These are something to be fostered and grown. The friendlies. I study the friendly insects that are out there. We're going to be talking about, today, we're going to be talking about diversity. And how biodiversity helps you on the farm. Alright. So, when I tell people that I am an entomologist, a lot of people think the only good bug is a dead bug. After all, there are many pests. There are actually entomologists that estimate around the world there are about 3,500 species of pests. 3,500 species of pests. I mean, these things are, are eating our crops. These things are stealing the drain right out of your grain bin. These things are these things are biting our children in the night. These things are transmitting diseases. Insects have literally changed the courses of wars. More soldiers have been killed by insects than by bullets or bombs because of all the diseases that insects transmit. 3,500 species, that is an army of insects. We need to do something, people. We need to kill all these insects. Let's wipe them off on the face of the earth. No, that is not what I study, that is not what I do. When you think from a pest-centric perspective, you have to realize that for every one of those 3,500 pest species, there is 1,700 species of insects that are actually beneficial, that are helping humankind. Without them, the quality of human life <laughs> would be very much diminished, if we'd exist at all, quite frankly. Um, and when we are only focused on those few pest species and ignoring all of the services and benefits that insects can provide to us, we're missing a really important opportunity that costs you money. Insects are the most diverse animals on the planet. <laughs> what are some of these benefits? Well, what is going on with my slides? <laughs> Jumping all over the place. Okay, basis of complex food webs. If I had to put it all in a nutshell, one short statement, I would say that the benefits of insects is that they are the basis of complex food webs. More specifically, how many of you guys like to hunt? Any hunters in the audience? If you like to hunt, think an insect. Insects are the food that feeds the wildlife that you like to hunt. If you spray insecticides unnecessarily or too much, you may as well go hunt someplace else. How many of you guys like to eat fruits and vegetables? Any fruits and vegetable likers? 95 species of crops are pollinated by insects. Without insect pollination, you do not have the seed or the fruits or the vegetables that we need to survive. And imagine losing 30% of your crop every year. That is what we are asking the honeybee industry right now, which is a billion dollar industry in this country to sustain. They lose 30% of their hives due to colony collapse disorder. We can do something to help this industry as farmers. I hate to say it folks, but insects are a major component of human diets. Western European cultures are the only uh, cultures on the face of the earth that do, new, uh, that do not rely on insects as a major source of protein in their diet. Uh, crabs, crab legs, lobsters, hate to say it guys, but these are, this, this is just a big bug. Uh, insects are uh, more efficient at, trans tra at, uh, at transferring uh, food into into biomass than any livestock that we currently produce. And as we move forward as, as a culture, um, I think that we're going to be seeing more and more insects on our dinner plates. I have recipes, I have cookbooks. <laughs> I can help you out. 
Uh, insects return nutrients to the soil. Dung beetles. Okay. Nutrients are in the soils. Plants pull those nutrients up. Cows come through, they chew on the plants, they eat them, they crap it out. Those nutrients are not available for the next generation of plants until organisms like insects drag those nutrients back down into the ground and make them bioavailable for microbes that then can complete that cycle. Without insects as part of this, without insects as a cog on this wheel that Jay Fuhrer was talking about, we are missing the total picture. But insects don't necessarily need to be uh, rely on big ruminants to be decomposers. They can also be direct decomposers of some of these plant materials on their own as well. Things like earthworms, things like columbia, little springtails, they're very jumpy, as the name would suggest. All right, insects are nature's insecticides. Predators, parasitoids, reduce herbivores on plants. We can use these to manage our crop pests. They're free. Insects are nature's herbicides. Herbivores, granivores, herbivores eat the green tissue, granivores eat seeds, literally shape the density and dispersion of plants as they occur within a habitat. We can use these to manage our weeds. These are free. All right. Biodiversity, lots of services provided by insects. What kinds of things am I talking about when I'm talking about insect diversity here? All right, let's, uh, let's talk about insect communities and exactly how many species live in these insect communities. Uh, we're giving farmers, entomologists, and, and crop consultants give farmers advice on what insects they should be treating in their cornfields in eastern South Dakota. I thought, well, this must be based on good information. We must have a really good handle of where all these insects are occurring in our state. The reality is that there has never really been a concerted effort to try to describe what insects were occurring in South Dakota cornfields. So what were we basing this information on? We decided to change this. We sampled 53 farms in eastern South Dakota. Characteristics of these farms is that they had to be more than 10 acres in size. They had to be non-BT corn. This is whack when you could actually find non-BT corn. <laughs> now we have refuge in a bag, right? Okay, we also wanted no insecticides, but we actually couldn't find many fields that didn't have insecticides on them because we are treating almost all of the insecticide or all of the seeds of corn with insecticidal seed treatments. Why would we do that when we're already killing the key pests of corn using BT? I don't know, but it's costing you money. That's an aside. So we had to go with the minimal insecticide, right? Hopefully all that insecticide was out of the plant by the time we were sampling the insect communities. What did we find in these cornfields? We did identified 107 insect species just in the corn canopy. Of these, 7% of these species were primary pests. These are the ones that you need to worry about. These are the ones that are eating your plant that can affect yield. But none throughout the entire state over two years on 53 farms, none of these things were at economically damaging levels. Should we be investing every year in insecticides or BT that we don't necessarily need? That's a lot of money. 13% of these species were, ha were eating the corn plant. These are herbivores. But in general, I mean, they just are not affecting yields. The corn is compensating for it. It's not something to worry about. So 20% of these species are, what the heck is going on with this thing? I didn't touch a button, guys. All right, 20% uh, of these species are herbivores, right? What were the rest of those insects? We had between four and a half and five and a half predators per plant. <laughs> I'm going to set this down and uh, we're going to <laughs> It's got a mind of its own here. Where's my bag? I've got another laser pointer here. Uh, so. What does that calculate out to be? About 150,000 predators per acre, just in the corn canopy here, folks. That is a ton of predator power. 
So, when, and then that's just in the canopy, right? I mean, we, uh, how many of you guys know Dwayne Beck? He's in Dakota Lakes Research Farm? Yeah. Uh, so, he was putting out a thousand corn rootworm eggs per row foot on his farm into that soil that he's got there. We never saw a rootworm come out. I did the survey work on it. He has a billion predators per acre in his soil alone. That's not in the canopy, that's in the soil. He doesn't have to put insecticides into his field anymore because he's healed the soil of his farm. And that, this is a consistent thing that we've seen uh, on farmers that are doing this. Okay, the question that I get oftentimes is if we have all these predators, I mean those were conventional fields, right? If we have all of those predators, then why are we still experiencing pests? This is a question that I've had to battle over the years because it doesn't make sense to me. I feel like there's an awful lot of predator power out in those fields. They should be reducing the, the pests below, below economic thresholds. But the, what I'm coming to realize is that even though there are hundreds of thousands per acre, that is not enough. How do we, so what, what I ended up having to do is I had to take a step back. And I had to ask the question of before cornfields were out there, or cropland in general, what kind of predator population, what kind of insect diversity did we see in those habitats that corn and cropland replaced? Things like grasslands, things like prairies. What are we talking about in terms of diversity there? We had a master's student. We had a, we had a master's student. Uh, Ryan Schmidt, who decided to work on this, he worked um, in prairies, pastures, and cornfields within uh, Brookings County. And surprisingly, there's been almost no survey work to try to describe the biodiversity in, you know, ancestral and current crop production uh, in these different habitats within a focal region. Um, and so we really don't have a really clear picture until Ryan went about and did this. Um, Wow, that's going to get really old, you guys. Uh, before Ryan went through and did this work uh, here in Brookings County. So what did he do? He characterized all of the plant species, all of the insect communities um, on these fields. All right, and so for insect communities, how did he sample these? He used a sweet net, you know, through the foliage. He also, um, actually it was a bug vacuum. Uh, but same, same insect community as those sweet bats would provide. Uh, he looked on the soil surface, he sucked up anything he found there, and then he took soil cores. You know, we did golf cup cutters, and, and we uh, put those into a coffee can, and then we turn a light on over them, and it gets real hot, and then all the insects, ah, the light! And so they crawl down, and we have a little canister of ethanol waiting for them, and they die. It's <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> for a good cause. All right, uh, the, so for the plant communities, he used transects. Uh, and so he described the diversity. Oh, my gosh. Okay, what did we find? 2,700 <laughs> specimens representing 344 <laughs> insect species were collected. That's a tremendous community. I'm, we're still trying to put names on a lot of this stuff. A lot, probably some of them have never been identified. Uh, 75 plant species. How many did we have in cropland? Two. Corn and a weed. <laughs> What did we find out? Corn has 25% of the diversity, the total species richness that used to occur in these habitats. Yeah. So for these systems, these natural systems where pests do not have outbreaks, they have three times the amount of diversity than what our current agricultural systems have. Okay, who cares? How does biodiversity work? What can it do for farming? <laughs> oh, wow. Does somebody else have a little thing in their audience right now and is playing around with me? <laughs> We're going to get to the end of this thing much faster than I wanted to. All right. Uh, um, how does biodiversity work for you? Um, in, a, in a nutshell, we cannot replace ecological processes with technology. When we try to replace Mother Nature with technology, invariably she kicks us in the crotch. 
What we need to do is we need to figure out how to work with Mother Nature on our farms to provide a lot of these services. One of these services that we can take advantage of is predation. So this is a good example. This is Aureus insidiosus, the insidious flower bug. It's about yay large. It's, uh, it's three millimeters in length. Got this piercing, sucking mouth part. And this is a soybean aphid that this, this, this female is sucking dry. Uh, <laughs> the aphid's trying to defend itself by squirting out some sticky stuff out of its butt. <laughs> silly, silly, silly. <laughs> All right. Predation and managing a pest. Predator diversity and managing a pest. How does diversity work for you? So within the ecological literature, so entomologists and ecologists are kind of like right now in the literature, like battling it out as scientists will. Ah! Um, what they're saying is that as you, some people that are against uh, increasing diversity are saying, as you increase diversity, you are increasing the number of predator species, and therefore, by saturating that community, by putting so many species, instead of eating your focal pest, they're going to start eating each other. And this is true, it's called intraguild predation. But the problem is, is that most of this work has been done in a petri dish or in like a little, uh, in a little cage, they call them mesocosms, with like five different predator species. And I'm of the mindset of, we don't have, you know, five predator species in our system. We've got hundreds of species. And so there's a washout, right? And I have data to show. Okay, rootworms. We're going to turn to the corn rootworm. Huge pest, most severe pest of corn in the world, per, uh, of agriculture in the world. Most expensive pest to manage. This is multi billions of dollars I spent every year managing this sucker. Right now, you have, if you planted corn last year, chances are pretty good you've got some corn rootworm eggs that are sitting at the base of your plants because those beetles lay eggs at the base of corn plants. The, they overwinter the next spring. They are hoping that you plant corn again because they only eat corn. Uh, those larvae hatch, they eat the roots, as the name would suggest. And those plants fall over, very difficult to harvest. They are, uh, the physiology of the grain is uh, reduced, or I'm sorry, the, the plant is reduced, yields are reduced. Very bad pest. It recognized as a pest for about 100 years. Actually, it originated from around here, uh, before the corn bridge came through Nebraska. This was a very localized pest. Millions of dollars have been spent on this pest, researching how to kill it, and we have figured something out. We have figured out that whatever we throw against the corn rootworm, it chews it up, spits it out, and then it flips us the bird. <laughs> because this is one of the most resilient pests in, in that we've ever experienced. Um, Started with soil insecticides. Soil insecticides didn't work very well. You had to have very direct contact with the pest. And usually we could get at most about 50% kill. Then they became resistant. Um, crop rotation comes in. Crop rotation worked wonderfully for about 35 years. Still works throughout much of the country. Uh, I'm a big advocate for rotating crops. Um, but what happened is that the pests became resistant to it, not once, but twice. Instead of laying their eggs at the base of corn plants, they started laying their eggs at the base of soybean plants so that they would hatch the next year into the corn crop. So they figured out our rotation. The other one, uh, instead of overwintering one winter, they wintered two winters, so they skipped the soybean phase of the rotation. Amazing pest, but don't worry, it's all in the bag. Technology will set us free. BT corn comes out, targets this thing. We uh, selected for resistance in the laboratory within three generations. Field resistance to BT is now spreading throughout the country. Didn't take long. Neonicotinoid seed treatments are now being used to target the corn rootworm. They're already resistant to a number of different insecticide chemistries. Guess what's going to happen? They're going to become resistant. RNAi, pesticidal RNAi, with a new generation of genetically modified crops is coming out. It's going to solve everything, everybody. Problem solved. It's all in the bag. In spite of this pest, 
suffering 99% mortality of those eggs die in the soil. There was almost no work on natural enemies. What was killing them in the soil? until I came around, and this has been a real priority for me to try to understand, and what I've been able to understand is that as predation increases, root damage by the corn rootworm diminishes. Very clear relationship. We can use predators to reduce the impact of the pest on these crops. When I started, people, or the entomologist told me there are no natural enemies of corn rootworms, so we had to develop some new technologies. What we did, we collected a bunch of predators. We chopped off their head, from the field, we chopped off their heads, we cut off their butts, and we ripped out their stomachs. And then we subjected that stomach to a DNA analysis. We looked for rootworm-specific fragments of DNA in the stomachs of these predators. So we could tell which predators were actually eating corn rootworms under the soil. Very powerful technique, and what we have found is that dozens, probably close to 80 species of predators are now known to consume corn rootworms in normal corn fields. Lots of predation going on in those fields. Okay, so can we use this technique to study how increasing diversity affects corn rootworm populations? 16 fields we sampled, three patches were infested with our handy dandy corn rootworm egg infester. This is, uh, and we can calibrate it. We usually calibrate it for around 1,000 eggs per row foot. It squirts it right into the corn row. Poor corn plants. All right, soil cores to collect pest larvae and soil communities. So we took the soil cores using our golf cup cutter and then we collected up those predators and we looked inside their stomachs. Here's one right now. And inside this stomach lies DNA of the corn rootworm. This is the data we get. What a mess. But ecologists love this crap. Oh, well, so all of these are different predator species. This is the proportion of those predator species that have consumed corn rootworms. And, and people, oh gosh, you know, oh, well, you know, I mean, here we've got this coleoptera, this beetle larva, look at that, that one ate a lot, but oh, oh, it's only in one field, oh, and down here we've got an ant, oh, that's in 14 fields, and is that more important than this one? And this one likes to tickle this one, and I don't know what's going on down here. <laughs> stop, stop. We need to take, we need to realize that these predator communities change, that these predator communities are dynamic, that we cannot focus just on individual species. We need to be considering these things as a unit. And when we do that, it simplifies life so much more because this is what a farmer needs to know, the proportion of positive per plot by that predator community. 6%. It doesn't seem like a lot, but you have to understand this method. This means that six, because as soon as you eat a meal, as soon as a beetle eats a meal, it instantly starts digesting that DNA. So you can only detect the rootworm's DNA within the stomachs of these predators within the first, uh, you know, maybe eight hours. So 6% of that predator community had eaten root corn rootworms in the last eight hours. 6% of the 2,000 predators that we collected doesn't seem like a lot. 6% of a billion predators per acre that had just consumed corn rootworms in the last eight hours? It's a lot of predation. That is a lot of predation. But you see there's error bars. And the error bars is what I'm after. Because those error bars means that there's variability in this data. That means that predators are eating corn rootworms at a different rate in each of these fields. They also were, had a different abundance. There was different numbers of predators in each of these fields. And there was different diversity of predators, like number of species. So each of these dots is a field. And what we found is that as predator abundance increases, the frequency of predation on corn rootworms increases. Why would more abundant predator communities eat rootworms at a greater rate than, uh, than a less abundant predator community? It means that there's not a saturation, that we're not, that we that down here. We're not eating as many rootworms as this predator community could. As diversity, as the number of species increases, this is a Shannon index, which is just a, a, a yeah, this doesn't mean the number of species per plot. This means uh, 
It's an index. Uh, I don't want to get into it. All right. Uh, very commonly used. As diversity increases, the frequency of predation increases. More diverse communities consume rootworms at a greater level than less diverse. The more species you have, the more numbers you have, the more rootworms get eaten. Why would this happen? Why do more diverse and more abundant predator communities eat rootworms more frequently? And it gets back to right here. Anybody ever get one of these things? Man, those orange creams suck. <laughs> They're always the last chocolate in this thing. Corn rootworms are the orange creams of the insect world. The insects, just like in my family, you know, I mean, we go through, eat the peanut butter ones and the, and the nougat ones. Those are all gone right away. In the insect community, they are eating the most palatable, the tastiest prey they can first. And they're saving the crap for last. <laughs> Corn rootworms are that species. And let me give you an example. If I can get this to work, let's see. Okay, this is a predator eating a corn rootworm. Takes a bite and starts to react. Look at this thing. This is what I do when I eat an orange cream. <laughs> In spite of this being a pest, for a hundred years, nobody had described the fact that it was an <laughs> Its blood instantly coagulates on an insect's mouth parts, especially these chewing insects that have, you know, the, the, yeah, the side mandibles, right? Um, not only does it coagulate faster than any other blood that I think has been recorded, we haven't, we haven't uh, officially described just how fast this is, but people that I've talked with are like, man, that's an instant. Um, uh, but this blood also has a repellency. It may even have a toxicity to the predators. So it has this two-fold uh, anti-predator defense. Rootworm doesn't seem too bothered, does he? But this, not all predators are equally affected by this thing. If you have sucking mouth parts, it seems to be that these sucking, that things like spiders, things like ants that, have, like, with, that are fluid feeding, it seems like these predators are much less affected by that defense. So, and this is really well documented in the field, this is uh, gray bars are sucking predators, chewing predators are black bars, this is the prey consumption index. And then what we see is that for both uh, the egg stage of the pest and the larval stage of the pest, the sucking predators seem to have a much higher prey consumption index than those chewing predators. That means that the sucking predators do not view those rootworms as the orange creams. And therefore, as diversity of the predators starts to increase, it's a flat line. They will, represent, they will rely on, their, on that prey item regardless of how diverse that community is. But when we look at the chewing predators, the ones that don't like corn rootworms, it takes a certain number of species before those chewing predators will start to eat the corn rootworms. What does this mean? This means even though we have a lot of predators in our field, it's not enough. We need to saturate these predator communities with species and abundance in order to drive them into eating corn rootworms. Corn rootworms are not unique in having anti-predator defenses. Pests in agriculture are pests for a reason, and it's because they're able to avoid some of these defense, or they have defenses against the, the predators that would eat them, that would normally keep them in check. So that is how diversity is helping reduce predator or prey or pests in your field. How do we get more predators in cropland? It's simple, you reduce disturbance and you increase diversity. It's simple conceptually, it's more challenging practically, but there are ways. How would you reduce disturbance? I'm at a no-tail meeting for crying out loud. <laughs> oh, for crying out loud. Okay, not a lot of diversity here, folks. We need to get, by tilling, by leaving fallow, by leaving bare soil, soil with no armor on it, we are creating a situation every spring, the first colonists of your field are the primary pests that are looking for a perfect meal. 
There are no natural enemies to resist them. You are constantly on this cycle of having to input insecticides to keep this broken system alive. Planty covers helps that. Increasing diversity on farms. Rotate your crops. The more diverse rotations you can get into your system, the better. <coughs> Intercropping, getting more than one species into your field at any one time. Smaller plots, more crops. These are all agronomically feasible. Cover crops. These are not just simple one-way mixtures, because a one-way mixture is a monoculture. A one-way mixture is an imbalance in nature. These are, ah! These are diverse cocktails of cover crops. The guys that are most successful in reducing or eliminating their insecticide needs are the ones that are using, you know, 10, 20 way mixtures of cover crops that are adapted to their land. Conservation strips, field margins. Field margins are not something to be mowed. Field margins are not something to be hayed. Field margins are an important tool for conserving beneficial insects that then spill over onto your cropland and reduce your need for insecticide inputs. Weeds, I hate to say it folks, weeds are just plants out of place and if you've got your system in balance, then weeds can be an important source of biodiversity. We can use diversity to increase predators. Those predators then reduce your pests. Those predators then reduce your need for insecticides. They save you money. Cover crops as a pest management tool, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Compared no-till cornfields planted with cover crops, slender wheatgrass, it was a monoculture of slender wheatgrass, but it still worked. The, oh, I'm sorry, I just ruined the whole story. Uh, bare soil was the alternative uh, uh, system. We infested it with a thousand corn rootworm eggs per row foot, counted the pest populations, looked at root damage by these things in these two treatments over two years. We looked for predator populations using quadrat samples, and then we put these larvae that are called sentinel larvae, we took rootworms that we raised in the lab, we stuck a pin through their butts, and then we put them out in the field. After one hour, we went out there and looked at, to see how many had con been consumed. Uh, if you guys have ever been to Gail Fuller's place, uh, we've done this as a unit uh, um, during the summer times. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it's 30, 40% in an hour of these larvae that get hammered. What happened? Effects on predators, black bars are cover crops, bare soil is gray bars, this is number of predators per meter squared. Cover crops increase predators dramatically. 300 per meter squared? I have a question. Yeah. When were you killing that cover crop or were you killing it? Yeah, that's a great question. We killed it before we planted the crop. So this was actually the benefits of the residue and the cover that was provided by that. I would really like to get it to a system where we can have living vegetation throughout much of the season and still take the crop off. Yes, sir? What about strip crop? Where you did it in, say, strips, so you had three or four different crops you growing, which you do in 60 foot or 20. I love that idea. I love that idea. I don't know that it's ever been tested how it would affect this stuff. Um, but conceptually, it works for this, for what we're trying to do here. Effects on crop damage, root ratings were reduced in the cover crop treatment in both seasons. <clears throat> cover crop fields experienced less pest damage. Effects on the corn rootworms. Larvae per plot. First instars are the babies. Second instars are, you know, I don't know, grade schoolers. And third instars are the teenagers. Those are the ones we want to get rid of. Um, <laughs> Okay, the cover crops, gray, black bars, gray bars, bare soil, same populations until the third instar when the cover crops are, have reduced corn rootworm populations by two-thirds. What is going on here? What's going on here is that you're aggregating predators, first off, into your fields using your cover crops. Second off is you're changing the root structure of that plant, making it less suitable as a host. The rootworm larvae then leave, and they are hammered by the predators. That's what I think is going on. Cover crops, adults, yeah, you have fewer larvae, you have fewer adults. Diverse predator communities reside within farmlands. Our decisions influence how much they contribute to pest levels. 
We need to be thinking about healthy communities, not individual species here. If you are, and it's, this is your decisions. You are at the driver's seat here. If you decide to increase biodiversity and habitat and reduce habitat diversity or habitat disturbance, you can start to replace your input costs. Doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. Sometimes it does happen overnight. What you saw with that corn rootworm experiment was one season. What is going on? Okay, we're gonna switch gears here. I'm going to talk about diversity some more. How does diversity help you? How, does diver how do we understand diversity? Are we even at the point where we can get what's going on with all of this diversity? There's new stuff coming out all the time on the complexities of food webs and, bi and, and biodiversity within natural systems. I'm going to talk about granivores, seed feeding insects, weed seeds. Seeds are abundant. Seeds are nutritious. This should not surprise you. That's why we rely on seeds as our main staple crops, right? We eat them. Seeds are very abundant. Hundreds of thousands per meter square. Whoa! That was getting really crazy. Okay. Hundreds of thousands of seeds per meter square can be produced. These aren't necessarily weeds. Why is this happening? Alright, we gotta do something here. Okay, seeds are very nutritious too. This is, uh, I went, I wrote a little book, um, and we looked at the nutrient content of insect prey versus seeds. Black bars are prey, gray bars are seeds. This is calories, protein, lipids, carbohydrates. In all cases, seeds have more calories, seeds have about the same amount of protein, seeds have more lipids, and seeds on average have more carbohydrates than insect prey. Why aren't all insects eating seeds then? Well, a lot of them do, but it's because a lot of these seeds have, have um, uh, although these large categories of nutrients are the same, they have different micronutrients and things like that. And if you are what you eat, and, and an insect is better adapted to consuming insect prey that is uh, more physiologically, more physio phys physiologically, um, similar to its own body matrix. Okay. Um, so, for that reason, uh, there needs to be specialized adaptations that these insects must evolve in order to have or be able to consume seeds on a regular basis. So when I'm talking about gra uh, granivores, what is it that I am talking about? We did some work where we marked some seeds and then we looked inside the stomachs of the various, uh, a whole community of insects and what we found is that the most frequent consumers of seeds within this particular habitat were things like millipedes, armyworms I've heard them called, they're in my basement, um, small crickets. Crickets are a really valuable tool for you guys. They eat weed seeds, they are also really important predators. Um, so crickets are a good thing. Isopods, uh, roly polies, pill bugs, I've heard them called, also <coughs> in my basement. Um, Gorillas pennsylvanicus, black field crickets, those are those big guys. I know you got them down here. Ground beetles, very important uh, seed consumer. Ants are also a very important seed consumer. But not all of these species have an equal effect. Each of them has certain preferences for particular seeds. We don't know all the time which, what, why they are preferring particular species, but it's probably based on the nutrition, the defense, and the size and structure of each of these seed species, and the physiological status of the insect. You know, If they're starting to reproduce, they need certain nutrients in order to do that. But what we do know is that each species has its own individual preferences. Here's Gryllus. That's a big cricket. Uh, crabgrass, they love little grass seeds. Whereas these uh, crabbit beetles, this is the one that started freaking out at my rootworm larva. Uh, they are also a very, very important seed consumer. Uh, like these little amaranths, kind of, or lamb quarter, lamb's quarter seeds, uh, they like those small ones. So, just to illustrate to you that there's preferences. What's driving those preferences? Well, we thought it was just the insects and the seeds. But when we were, but then I started thinking about it. Cows have bacteria in their stomachs. Those bacteria help them eat their digest plant material. We have bacteria in our stomachs. Those things help us digest donuts. 
insects have bacteria in their stomachs. And what we found is that when I gave crickets and carabid beetles Carpalis, um, antibiotics and killed those bacteria, seed consumption was reduced by 40%. Antibiotics reduces seed consumption. So this is, we fed them eggs, which is a very palatable prey seeds, which is, uh, you know, something that I told you they need adaptations for. The antibiotics didn't affect their ability to consume seed, or eggs, but it did reduce their ability to consume seeds. And what we found through more research is that it's one bacteria, Enterococcus fecalis. When it is in an insect's stomach, it is able to digest a lot more seeds than when it's absent. This is an endosymbiote. This is a symbiotic or relationship. We think of biodiversity as being all the organisms that we see out there. But those organisms are oftentimes simply vessels for the bacteria that they are carrying around. How do we get symbionts into our system so that these crickets, so that these granivores can increase seed consumption within our system, within our farmland? What affects symbiont populations? Biodiversity does. Remember Ryan? He did that nice study in the prairies, the pastures, and then the cornfields. This is what he found, bacteria in the stomachs of these two crickets that were collected from each of those sites. Through our decisions, through our management practices, we are driving down not only the number of species within our agroecosystems, but we're also the ones that are remaining in those agroecosystems are less able to provide us services because we're reducing their symbiont populations. Reducing biodiversity has far-reaching effects that we cannot predict more often than not. When you tug on a strand of a spider's web, when you tug on, when you remove species out of a web of, of a community, it affects everything else. It's connected, isn't it? And guess who lives right here? That's us. That's us. We need to realize that we, what our decisions, when we're only focusing on an individual insect pest, <coughs> or only on a particular species within of that system, that it is affecting everything else that lives in and around that system. We need to step back. We need a humbler approach to pest management. We need to realize that we aren't always in control, but if we get the heck out of the way and let Mother Nature take her course, then suddenly we can get off of this, band, or this, this treadmill of, of, of inputs that cost people money. We need to learn how insects communities function within natural systems like prairies, like grasslands, like pastures even, well-managed pastures. And we need to replace key processes back into agroecosystems. And there's ways we can do this that are agronomically feasible, if only we give it the chance. Many people have helped with this. This is my email. I don't have any business cards, but if you want to get a hold of me with questions, stories, thoughts, concerns, that's how you get a hold of me. Jiggle entomology. Uh, that's, those are actually my initials. Chrissy pointed out that it would sound out phonetically jiggle. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, this is my research group. None of this would be ha uh, happening without Janet Fergan. Boy, it's that woman's pretty amazing. And everybody else. What a great group. Uh, lots of people helped out, collaborators, professional scientists, and economists up on campus. Uh, James is over in Kentucky, Deirdre's in uh, North Dakota, uh, Czech Republic, lots of funding. If you like what you hear, if you like what you see, if you want to see research being done by federal scientists on risk assessment and on ecologically based pest management, email these two men. We are in the middle of a revision of, for the Earth, a five-year strategic plan to decide what research ARS entomologists are going to do for the next five years. Um, if your voices are not at the table, then, then, then traditional entomology is going to rule the day. Uh, squirt and count, spray and pray. Uh, but if you want to see this kind of research being developed to try to answer some of your questions, please email these guys. A short email will go a long way. Um, if you don't like what you see, then forget this slide ever existed <laughs> and remember that video or something. And with that, thank you.
Thank you guys for coming and thanks for listening.